On September the 1st, 1939, two days before the Second World War was announced, blackouts were introduced to British civilians. At sunset on that day, the country was plunged into darkness. At first, the rules on blackouts were strict. Anyone found showing light during an air raid could be severely fined. As time went on, they relaxed the rules slightly, with some use of glimmer illumination being allowed. This was brought in because of the amount of accidents and injuries caused by lack of light. By January 1942, one in five people had some sort of injury that had been caused by the blackout. The days were scary enough, but the nights were even more so. With the transport being restricted because of petrol rations, many people had no option but to walk to and from their intended destination, both day and night. And with a lack of trained police officers, an undermanned police force was struggling to cope with the rising crime. In February 1942, the days were shorter and the nights longer. It was bitter cold and a little snow lay on the ground. 40-year-old Evelyn Hamilton, a well-educated woman, originally from a village in Tyne and Weir, had been living and working in Essex at Yardley's Chemist for only three months. On the 6th of February, Evelyn dressed for the weather. She knew it was her last day as manageress at the Yardley's store, as all the staff had been given notice due to the shop closing. Evelyn wasn't so concerned. She was a practical woman and had managed to get another pharmacist job. Although it meant moving to Grimsby, she seemed to be looking forward to the change. On Sunday the 8th of February, she packed a small case. Dressed in thick woollens and a full-length coat, donned her hat and scarf, grabbed her brown leather bag, said goodbye and left. This is what's known about her movements that night. Evelyn Hamilton arrived at Hornchurch Station at 7.20pm and purchased a one-way ticket to London. She arrived at Aldgate East Station at 9.40pm. It was dark but she had a torch. She hopped on board the Hammersmith Line train to Baker Street. From there she got a taxi that took her to the Three Arts Club Hotel. It was around 10.15 when she checked in and after finding it was too late for food at the hotel, she went out to find somewhere to eat. She got into a taxi to find a place that was still open for food. After at least an hour of which her movements seemed to be unaccounted for, she was served food at a corner house tea room at around midnight. She wasn't seen alive again. On Monday morning, the 9th of February at 8.40, Harold Batchelor and William Baldwin were walking to work through the fresh fallen snow. As they passed one of the air raid shelters on Montague Place, they noticed some items of clothing in the snow. They got closer and to their horror found a woman's body. Evelyn's body had been left laying partly inside the shelter. She was fully clothed, although her top clothes had been torn open and her underwear pulled down, leaving her lower area exposed. At 8.51am, PC John Mills heard cries for help from the two men and ran to the scene. Detective Inspector Leonard Clear arrived. After taking in the scene in front of him, he listened to the statement from the men who had found her. One of the men, Bachelor, said, I was walking with my mate, walking through Dorset Street across into Montague Street. Along Montague Street, we were on the left-hand side, going to Otaway Road. In between two of the shelters, I saw the top of an electric torch. My mate went towards it and showed me something inside the shelter. I saw the body of a woman lying on her back. D.I. Clear looked closer at the scene. He noted how the woman's body, who at that time they obviously didn't know who she was, had been left, and how her outer clothing, hat, scarf and gloves, had been purposely placed in the position they were found. He also noted the absence of a handbag. The police surgeon, Dr Alexander Baldy, arrived at 9.10am and the police photographer began taking the crime scene photos. Dr Baldy's first examination deduced that death was caused by manual strangulation, but of course he would know more after the autopsy. 
Detective Chief Superintendent Frederick Cheryl, who was the head of Scotland Yard's fingerprint department, arrived at the scene. Cheryl, an expert in fingerprinting and who had helped solve many cases with his expertise, began his investigation. With his magnifying glass in hand, he looked closely at the injuries on Evelyn's body and took note of the surroundings she'd been left in. His examination led him to note the person who had done this was left-handed, but he needed to go through the belongings left at the scene to see if they could shed more light on the poor woman's demise. The investigation moved on with the police knocking on doors and asking questions of residents in the area. A reserve constable came forward. He informed Clear that he had been patrolling that night and hadn't noticed anything unusual, only the odd soldier looking for accommodation, at which time that wasn't unusual. He had sent them in the direction of the Church Army Hostel in Seymour Place. At 5.20am he did notice a man walking quickly towards Edgware Road. He could only give a brief description of the man as it was still dark. He was slim built and about 5 foot 8. As the man got slightly closer he could make out some details. He saw blonde or light brown hair and noted he was well spoken and wearing an RAF uniform. He asked the constable if he could direct him to King's Cross. The constable also mentioned passing the shelters that night but hadn't noticed anything unusual. PC Miles returned to Clare. He held an empty wet handbag he had found laying on the ground on Wyndham Street that's not far away from where Evelyn had been found. It was bagged and sent to Cheryl. Unfortunately, after an extensive investigation of the items at the department, Cheryl didn't find much to help. He had taken the prints off of the woman and all the prints he had taken from the items, including the bag, matched the deceased woman. There were no other person's prints found. Dr Spilsbury, the doctor who became well known for his part in the Cripping case, performed the autopsy of the woman found in the shelter on the 9th of February. Spilsbury's report would say the cause of death being asphyxia due to strangulation by the left hand. There was no sign of S being performed on her and there was no clues to her identity. Evelyn's identity would come to light after the police went door to door with the photo of Evelyn and on the 12th of February they showed the photo to the manageress of the Three Arts Club who told them she had booked a room there. They gave them all the information they could. Evelyn's family were informed and her sister Kathleen ID'd her. After a while they had begun to build a picture of Evelyn's movements. They surmised that the killer must have moved quickly and quietly when attacking Evelyn while she made her way back to the hotel. 34 year old Evelyn Oatley had met her husband while performing as a chorus girl in Blackpool. She moved into the farm he owned. But after a while, she wanted to move back to London. So in 1936, she left her husband and returned to London, hoping to return to the stage. Unfortunately, Evelyn's dreams vanished when the war started. She couldn't find work and eventually with her good looks, she found work as a hostess in clubs. To make a little extra money, she would occasionally work the streets, often inviting the men back to her small room. On Monday the 9th of February, Evelyn Oatley sat in the King's Arms pub, waiting for an offer for her services. She had drank quite a lot as the night was fairly quiet and not many people seemed to be out. She left at last orders and joined a couple of other women. She was eventually approached by a man dressed in uniform, words were politely exchanged and she left with him. Back at her rooms, her neighbour, who Evelyn was friendly with, saw her with the man. She even spoke to them as they entered Evelyn's room. A little later that night, the neighbour heard unusually loud music coming from Evelyn's room, but after a while it all went quiet. At 8am the next morning, Charles Fulin and George Carter visited 153 Wardour Street, where Evelyn Oaks lived, to collect the money from the meters. Many homes back then had electric meters installed where they had to put money in for any electric to be used in the home. After Ivy Poole, Evelyn's friend and neighbour, let them in, 
They went to knock on Evelyn's door. Like a scene from a horror film, the door slowly creaked open. The men tentatively walked in, calling out as they entered. They shone a torch into the dark room, and what they saw was horrific. Running from the scene, they found Police Inspector Hennessy and cried out that they had just found a woman dead. Hennessy ran with them back to the house. Slowly walking into the room, he shone his torch and there he saw Evelyn Oatley was laying across her bed. The scene before him was brutal and depraved. Whoever had committed this crime must be a monster. At 8.50, Dr Baldy was once again looking at the body of a woman. He surmised she had been dead for only a few hours, at least three or four. D.I. Clarence Jeffrey entered the room. He saw the woman laying on the bed, a pillow on the floor laying under her. A razor blade lay on the blanket covered in blood. A pair of bloody curling tongs lay next to it. Now this bit is rather graphic, so a warning is in order. A bloody tin opener lay between her legs and a torch had been inserted into her, between her legs. The fingerprint department superintendent Cheryl and the police photographer were called immediately. Detective Inspector Charles Gray took control of the scene. He took in the scene around him and noted the forced entry into a wardrobe. A handbag lay open with the contents emptied out. Cheryl went to work straight away after the photographer had finished. He ordered all the items to be bagged and taken to his department. Sir Bernard Spilsbury arrived. Looking at the body, he saw bruising to the neck, leading him to say that a failed strangulation had possibly occurred before her throat was cut. The post-mortem concluded that Evelyn Oatley's cause of death was major hemorrhaging from the neck. Spilsbury suggested she was probably unconscious from the attempted strangulation before her throat was cut. The torch and the other injuries she suffered, he concluded, were committed after death. Meanwhile, at the fingerprint department, the meticulous Cheryl had a breakthrough. He found unknown prints on some of the items more to the point, he found prints from a person who was possibly left-handed. As of yet, there was no proof of a connection between the women, except maybe the possibility they were both killed by a left-handed man. The police continued to delve deep into the women's lives, looking for possible motives or clues. Detective Chief Inspector Edward Greeno was brought in from Scotland Yard's murder squad. He had a tough job ahead. The two women were from different lifestyles, one being a respectable, more mature woman who lived quietly alone, the other a working woman struggling to survive in the darkness of the underworld, selling her body to make ends meet. Reading the report from Cheryl, Greeno noticed the left-handed connection Cheryl had made and a murder map of the area was placed upon the wall with two pins placed where the two women had been found. With the depravity of the latter crime, Greeno and his colleagues were sure the murderer would kill again. Margaret Lowe, also known as Peggy, had left Southend-on-Sea when her husband Fred passed away. She put her daughter, who adored her, into boarding school for her own good and moved to London. Margaret turned to work in the streets and had done so for around 15 years. She carried herself with some grace and was well-spoken, earning her the nickname The Lady. She rarely frequented bars but had a habit of appearing slightly worse for wear. In the early hours of Wednesday, February the 11th, while sauntering down Shaftesbury Avenue, she took the fancy of a distinguished, well-spoken, uniformed man. Now, Margaret's long-suffering neighbour heard her come back to her flat with a man and instead of the usual noise she was used to, it was reasonably quiet. When the neighbour left her flat later that morning, she did notice a parcel outside of the neighbour's door. The parcel would remain there for some time. Margaret's body would be discovered by officers who had been called to the flat on Friday the 13th of February after concerns were raised about the parcel left outside. Detective Sergeant Blacktop managed to get a spare key from a neighbour and entered Margaret's dark home. 
The bedroom door was locked. He forced his way in. Margaret's body lay on a bed covered by a sheet and a pillowcase over her face. Blacktop pulled the sheet back and removed the pillowcase. She had been strangled. Doris Stewart, although married, had been working the streets before and after her marriage. She and her husband had been living in Harrogate before her husband left her and moved to London where he had been offered a job. Doris, who had been living with her mother, decided to move to London as well. She got an apartment near to her husband. Although they had had their problems, they got back together and moved into a flat at Sussex Gardens. Doris's husband was the manager of the hotel he worked at. He'd been working a lot of night shifts that week and on Thursday, February the 12th, he set off to work. His wife decided to walk with him to the station and was going to go straight home after leaving him. But later that night, Doris joined other working girls in a doorway. The work was sparse that night due to the weather and when one of the girls was offered work, the other girls parted ways. Doris wouldn't be seen alive again. Her body was found at her home. She'd been strangled with a stocking and mutilated so much so her stomach had been ripped open. There were wounds between her legs and a candle inserted down below. Mary Haywood on the 12th of February had been asked by an officer friend to meet for a meal at the Universal Brasserie that evening. She agreed. The restaurant was full of uniformed men and women that night. Mary sat at a table waiting for her friend. She was eventually approached by a young airman who asked her if she was waiting for someone. She replied she was as she had an appointment. He persisted and she relented to the offer of a drink at another bar. After spending a little time together, he had made it plain what he was looking for. She refused, telling him she wasn't like that. Mary went to leave to meet her friend, and the airman offered to walk her back. He asked if he could see her again, and she gave him her number, stressing she would not sleep with him. On the way, in the darkness, he pulled her into a dark doorway and tried to kiss her. She struggled and pushed him away. He then grasped her by the throat. She collapsed. Suddenly, a young man, John Shine, heard a scuffling coming from an alley. He walked over to where he heard the noise. He saw a woman's legs on the floor and glimpsed someone run from the doorway. Shine helped the woman up, offering to take her to the hospital. On the way they met P.C. James Skinner and the young man informed him that the lady had been attacked. He didn't see who had done it but had found his gas mask because he'd dropped it. This would be helpful to find the person as each RAF gas mask bag had an ID number. It was the breakthrough the police needed. After taking Mary's statement she was sent with the police officer to hospital. Detective Sergeant Shepherd made a call to the RAF police at Abbey Lodge Regents Park. He informed them that they had the mask but needed to know who it belonged to. Corporal Charles Johnson was tasked with the job of finding the owner of the mask. Once found, Johnson told the RAF police, who informed dear Shepherd the name of the person they were looking for was Gordon Cummins, but he wasn't in his room. Shepherd gave Johnson the details and asked him to detain Cummins when he returned to the billet. Before Cummins went back, he got another opportunity to kill. Catherine Malke had lived in London for 10 years. She had heard the gossip about a killer on the streets, but she didn't seem too worried. She stood outside Odin Dino's in Piccadilly. Although she could barely see him in the darkness, they discussed money and then made their way to Catherine's flat near Marble Arch by taxi. Once there, he undressed quickly and the naked airman pounced on Catherine while she lay on the bed. He had his hands around her throat. Gasping for breath, she struggled, pushing and wriggling as hard as she could to get free. Eventually, she managed to kick him in the stomach. Jumping over him, she ran for help, screaming, Murder! A woman came to help, but both the women were terrified when the naked man came back looking for his clothes. He dressed and walked off, leaving Catherine yelling, You're a murderer!
Cummins was caught trying to sneak into his billet at around 4.30am, way past the allowed time of 10.30pm. The orderly sergeant, Charles Johnson, demanded to know where he had been, as the civil police had been looking for him. He also noticed Cummins had a gas mask with him, but it couldn't be his as the police had it. It turns out, once he noticed his gas mask was missing, he went to a bar and took one from another soldier while he was distracted. DC Bennett, once informed Cummins had been detained, went to collect him from interrogation. Cummins was told he was being interviewed after a woman had been attacked. After searching Cummins' pockets, they found the phone number the victim had given him earlier. Detective Sergeant Thomas Shepard sat down to interview Cummins, who offered a statement about his movements that night. He told of going out drinking with some other airmen. He and another airman went on to another bar and drank quite a lot of whiskey and beer. They then decided to go on to the Trocadero where they carried on drinking. He went on to say his friend thought it was a good idea to go to the Universal Brasserie. It was there, he said, he talked to a woman who sat with him at a table, but he couldn't remember much after that. He was very drunk, but he vaguely remembered walking with her. His only explanation after this was he couldn't remember as he was too drunk. After this interview, Shepard noted how calm and relaxed Cummins had seemed. He had also noticed cuts on Cummins' fingers. Cummins told him he had received them a while ago while working on an engine. Shepard didn't believe Cummins' explanation. He arrested and charged him with assault. While Cummins sat in the police station, Detective Inspector Leonard Clare sat with a distressed Catherine Mulkey, listening intently to what she had to say. She told him she believed the man that attacked her was the same man they were looking for regarding the recent murders. She gave a description of the man and the money he had paid her was taken for evidence. Once Detective Inspector Clear found out Cummins had been arrested and heard the details of the attack, he was convinced Gordon Cummins was responsible for the murder of Evelyn Hamilton. The strangulation, the description of an airman and the attempts on two women all seemed to fit. Detective Chief Inspector Greeno, while investigating Doris Joannette's murder, also saw a connection. The reports coming in about Catherine Mulkey and Mary Haywood being violently choked made it clear strangulation was the preferred form of attack. George Cummins was a viable suspect. When Detective Tom Shepard went to search Cummins' billet, he found a shirt and towel with some blood spots on both items in his kit bag. He also found a pen with the initials DJ. Cummins went on to deny knowing anything about the pen and didn't know how it came to be in his pocket. An intense investigation into Cummins' activities that week by all the detectives and divisions involved with the murders and attacks led to evidence, although small and some circumstantial, being found. But what they found, evidence-wise, regarding Evelyn Oatley, was huge. A cigarette case was found at the back of a cupboard in the flat Cummins shared with other airmen. The initials LW was on it and confirmation from her husband that it was hers. Evelyn sometimes went by the name Letta Ward. Fingerprints were also lifted. Cummins had put removable soles on his boots to disguise his real footprints and threw them away. The police found them in a bin at the same flat. Margaret Lowe's daughter identified another cigarette case belonging to her mother. This was found in Cummins' jacket pocket. Cummins had paid Catherine Mulkey in pound notes. The notes were taken for evidence and it was discovered the serial numbers on them matched the notes Cummins had been paid from the Air Force. Doris Duanet's evidence had been found, i.e. the pen and comb that had been identified by her husband as being hers. There was a watch which was also ID'd by Doris's husband as hers. It had been attached to the strap of Cummins's gas mask case with elastoplast. This elastoplast that was found had come from Doris's bedroom. Mortar grains from the air raid shelter had been found on the gas mask case he carried. 
although he had been short of money before, he had been flush with money after the murder of Evelyn Hamilton. And it was known her purse was taken and that's where she carried all her money. This tied Evelyn Hamilton to Cummins. When Cummins was confronted with the evidence while he was being interviewed, his response was that he'd been drinking far too much and couldn't remember a lot of his movements that week. He hadn't revealed anything to the officers. In fact, he seemed very matter-of-fact with them. On February the 17th, Cummins was brought before the Bow Street Police Court, charged with the murders of Evelyn Oatley, Margaret Lowe and Doris Joannette. Lack of evidence for Evelyn Hamilton's murder meant he couldn't at that time be charged with the murder. It would be later, after a thorough analysis of the mortar, that they could charge him with a murder. After the court appearance, Cheryl could finally fingerprint Cummins, and as a bonus to this, Cummins signed the card with his left hand. When Cheryl's report came through, it was clear from the fingerprints found on the broken mirror in Evelyn Oatley's flat, they belonged to Cummins as did the prints found in Margaret Lowe's room on the bottle, glass and candlestick. On Monday, April the 27th, Cummins went to the Old Bailey Court, charged with four counts of murder. Cummins pleaded not guilty. The first murder he could be prosecuted for was Evelyn Oatley's, as this could be proved by the fingerprints found. After hearing all the witnesses and expert statements, and that of Cummins, the jury retired. After just 35 minutes, the jury returned with a guilty of murder verdict. Justice Asquith had the black cap placed on his head and delivered the sentence. Gordon Frederick Cummins, you have been found guilty of murder. You will be taken from this place to prison and thence to a place of execution where you will be hanged by the neck until you are dead. George Cummins was hung at Wandsworth Prison on June the 25th, 1942. To everyone who knew him, Gordon Cummins, although a little on the pompous side, seemed a likeable man. He was a rogue who enjoyed the company of women and a drink with the lads. He was well spoken and reasonably well educated. He was attractive and had an air of charm about him that showed through with a mischievous grin that came across his face. A married man, his wife Marjorie, who he had been married to since 1936, saw no signs of a monster in her husband. They were, so she thought, happy with their life. While with the Marine Aircraft Experimental Establishment, Cummins was sent to other parts of the country where he would indulge in different exploits with many other women. He was driven by his S needs, something he was heard to say his wife didn't satisfy to the full extent he desired. There was no problem with his career in the Air Force. In fact, it's been stated he was held in high regard by his superiors. With his pretentious, lavish lifestyle paid for by theft, Cummins had led a carefree life. He enjoyed the delusion of aristocracy he had given people to believe he was from. But in fact, he was born in North Yorkshire in 1914 to a fairly normal, reasonably well-to-do family. His father being a civil servant who ran a school for juvenile delinquents. He had a good childhood. There didn't seem to be any indication he would become a killer and a thief. He had a few minor problems where work was concerned, getting sacked because of bad timekeeping or just not showing any enthusiasm for his job. That was until he joined the Royal Air Force. But at the end of the day, it would seem Gordon Cummins held little regard for anyone but himself. He didn't care about those he hurt. He had no feelings for the women he killed. There was no remorse or apology. The only person that mattered to Gordon Cummins was Gordon Cummins. Thank you for watching.